Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to CPT webinar number five. We look forward to doing something very unusual this particular webinar, and that is not having any technical problems. We've sit, switched our site to the university that has a better bandwidth, uh, and uh, we also have our IT person here in case we have some difficulties. So uh, thank you for joining us, and hopefully this will be a little bit easier uh, from a technical standpoint. However, I do want to announce that uh, we did have some challenges during the NeuroPsych testing uh, webinar, which occurred uh, not that long ago, and we rescheduled it for November uh, 16th, which is a Monday, at 5.30 Eastern time. Uh, interestingly enough, lots of things have changed since that time. So in the webinar, even though it's a makeup webinar because of our technical difficulties, we'll have a fair amount of new information as well. So I uh, look forward to seeing you uh, then um, as our last of the series. Although I'm also curious about the possibility of doing another webinar, maybe in December on the latest on ICD. So stay tuned because we are now starting to see how the ICD evolves. So uh, thanks again. And finally, to ask questions, you can click on the grid in the right-hand corner of your screen, enable the Q&A button. I'll answer the questions as I can, especially towards the end. So with that, let's switch from this not particularly attractive face to our screen share. So we'll move to that. And let's go with the entire screen. Okay. There we are. Okay. Here we are. Okay. Again, here we are with the uh, webinar material. So let's uh, rock and roll and move forward. So first of all, a typical disclaimer that you've seen many times, certainly nothing new. I try to give you the best, the latest, and the greatest, but by no means am I 100% certain. So it's obviously your responsibility to keep up with uh, the material. So uh, good luck. and. Uh, Keep in mind that uh, this is an ever-changing situation. Many organizations have supported this, from the North Carolina Psych Association to the American Psychological Association, NAN, uh, the American Medical Association, and so forth. So uh, thank you to all of them, and uh, appreciate their support. Now, I wish I could take full credit for this, but obviously, it's not possible. Randy Phelps, uh, Jim Georgilakis, Neil Plitzkin have been very, very intimately involved. Lots of people have supported our work from uh, folks in the uh, AMA all the way to people in the uh, APA. So thank you to all of them. Realize that this is a huge team effort on many people's behalves. Uh, in case you don't know, I don't get paid for my work on CPT. They do cover my... Um, uh, my lodging and so forth so on but this is a pro bono uh, sort of work of love if you will I've been doing this since 1988 and here are the things that I've been involved with so clearly something that I've been uh, uh, doing very very closely very intently for a number of years this information does not supersede the APA ethical uh, guidelines which I hope will be changed in the not too far future HIPAA state province license regulations, uh, importantly, your contractual arrangements, and any professional standards that apply to you, depending on your profession. For those of you in psychology, for example, the standards for educational psychological tests, which I was involved in the revision. All right, so we are going to focus on two big activities or two big things today. I would say probably a third or so of the presentation will be a diagnosing. Uh, and the rest will be on payment models. And I'm going to just provide some overviews on diagnosing and then uh, probably speak uh, off the cuff on certain aspects 
of the material because there's so much to be said. Uh, first of all, it's important to appreciate that even though the DSM and the ICD exist, uh, and there are many, many diagnoses, and, you know, in the case of ICD, several thousand, it, this does not necessarily mean that the insurance companies would consider this to be appropriate for the work that you're doing. I also want you to start thinking about something that maybe is new to you, and that is multiple diagnoses. Uh, I put in this slide maybe a value. I really should change the slide and say multiple diagnoses will be the standard. Instead of just having one diagnosis like depression, you should probably be thinking of depression, dementia, whatever is appropriate and applicable. We are following the physician model and where they have multiple diagnoses, up to 5, 10, 15. I foresee the time where psychology will be doing the same, as applicable, of course. Uh, and I'll address that in, a, in great detail. Uh, we have, of course, a DSM and we have the ICD, uh, which are the two competing diagnostic systems. Now, I want to emphasize several things. Okay, well, let me go back to this one. First of all, the DSM is not truly really a diagnostic system. The ICD is. Let me explain what that is, uh, what I mean by that. First of all, the ICD contains all the diagnosis, physical and, if you will, mental. The DSM takes a portion of those existing diagnoses and then explains them. There's nothing necessarily special about the DSM. There are no, for all practical purposes, there are no diagnostics in the DSM that are not found in ICD. What you find in the DSM that you do not find in the ICD is the DSM has a wonderful description of the problems, including in some cases rule in and rule out. So appreciate the fact that the DSM is a wonderful descriptive system, not necessarily a diagnostic system. The DSM is limited in its scope for our work. Now, let me go into some detail about one particular thing as a precursor to our discussions on uh, basically the diagnosing aspect of CPT. Bill, the referral question, what did you pursue? Not necessarily what you discovered. If you go after dementia and you discover depression, you do not diagnose in the billing, in the billing, depression. You go after dementia. It would make no sense whatsoever to bill for 10 hours of testing, of neuropsych testing specifically for depression, but it would for, if you will, dementia. Now, what you end up with at the end of your report is the appropriate diagnosis that you have arrived. That is the result of your evaluation. It may or may not be the same as the billing diagnosis. And as I'll explain to you in a few minutes, that final diagnosis will be the foundation for future, future work and specifically future aspects of medical necessity. You ask what is medical necessity? Hang in there, I'll explain it to you in a few moments. All right, let's jump into the uh, ICD system. The ICD is the International Classification of Diseases. This is a system that is developed by the World Health Organization and has been started for a number of years. The ICD-9, which uh, as you see on this particular slide, was started in 1978 has been replaced uh, with the ICD-10. The ICD-10 there says October 21. It is not correct. It's actually October 1. The diagnostic system that we have is really two possible ones, ICD-10 or ICD-10-CM. ICD-10 is primarily used as a system to assess morbidity the active use of a diagnosis to describe a clinical condition is found in ICD-10 CM. How does that work? Essentially, 
what we have is a diagnosis that you could see in this one is 382.9 actually becomes B01.2. It's very, very different. What's important to appreciate is the ICD-10 has been released quite some time ago, and for a number of reasons, we have not accepted this system. Effective at the beginning of the month, that is the month that we're in, the federal government, and by default, all the insurance companies, now require the ICD-10 system. Let's go through that for a few moments. We have several levels. Level one is alpha, level two is numeric, Levels three to seven, it could be alpha or numeric. So a diagnosis might look like what you have there, 0DB588ZX. One of the things that is uh, important to appreciate is that it is not clear, at least to me, which ICD-10 diagnosis will be used. So what we have done is we have put together approximately a two to three hour workshop, which the slides are found in psychologycoding.com. We just updated these slides oh, about a week or two ago, adding new information, including new apps. And that information is as up to date as we can imagine. What we do not know is whether carriers are accepting this diagnosis or that diagnosis. So one of the things that we're going to do is we will post in psychologycoding.com probably on or about November 1 a an unusual Excel file that people will be able to populate that will allow individuals to drop down the diagnosis that they use, the carrier, and whether they this particular diagnosis or not was accepted. Because at this point, think about this. For all practical purposes, effective October 2015, we do not really know what diagnoses are being accepted by insurance carriers. And many of these are proprietary and do not publish their information. So as a consequence, we have some serious problems determining what diagnosis to use. And just because it's compatible diagnosis in ICD-9 or DSM-5 was applicable, it does not necessarily mean that that will be the case. For example, there are more diagnoses in ICD-10 than there were ICD-9, and DSM-5 basically matches to ICD-9. So we have maybe, maybe one-fourth of new diagnoses that were not found in DSM-5, number one. And in addition to that, to make matters worse, we don't know if the insurance companies are accepting former diagnosis, new diagnosis. This is all new to us. So as a consequence, we're going to try and, if you will, discover what's acceptable and what is not acceptable. Uh, and uh, we will have to sort of work through this. May I suggest that you carefully take a look at all your EOBs and make sure that you find what diagnoses are being accepted. One of the problems that we have is that the crosswalk is not that simple. The crosswalk between DSM-5 and, and ICD-9 is very good. The crosswalk between ICD-9 and ICD-10 is a little bit shakier. Now, here's the difficulty that I think we're going to encounter. First, you are going to be living in, most of us that is, in the F world. The F world essentially is where uh, chapter five of the ICD-10 system, ICD-10-CM. And, and again, I wanna encourage you to take a look at the material that's found in the uh, Psychology Coding webpage. But one of the difficulties there is that for many of us, this may not be appropriate or sufficient. So for example, if you are a quote, clinical psychologist with a small c as Medicare defines you, you are most likely gonna be working out of chapter five, 
which is section F. And probably the number of diagnoses are not going to be that big. The problems exist with two kinds of pro, uh, two kinds of diagnoses: anything involving health psychology and neuropsychology. Let's take the case of health psychology. Will you have to use an F code or a Chapter Five code, or alternatively, could you also, as maybe a secondary diagnosis, consider using uh, codes from any of the other? Uh, areas of ICD. This is a major issue that's at this point undefined. In the case of neuropsychology, you probably will be using an F code, but if you use F00, which is for all practical purposes dementia, you'll have to use a parent code. One of the things that we don't know is whether the parent code will be the primary code or the secondary code. Uh, and will you be able to build mental health or will you have to build medical? And if you build medical, will you be allowed to be a participant in that system? These are all questions that are undefined. And in your individual or, if you will, group practices, you need to go one more step to make sure that you find exactly what is acceptable. So keep in mind that in this particular case, if you think about ICD, don't think of it as a classification of diseases. Think of it as a classification of signs and symptoms. ICD, especially the 10, does not focus on diseases. It focuses on symptoms, which is quite different in many ways than the DSM and ICD-9. Uh, and I've said this before, and I want to emphasize it again today. Unlike the ICD-9, unlike the DSM, and for that matter, most of our training, you are now required for the first time to diagnose all existing diagnoses, or maybe I should say more than diagnose, report. So if you diagnose dementia and depression, but there is COPD, your job is to include all those. So you have to report the diagnosis that you have discovered, obviously, that you have pursued, and the diagnosis that come with the patient. If a patient comes with several medical diagnoses, you need to include those. Obviously, it's not in your best interest to include it as the primary diagnosis, because it could very well be that people might think that you're practicing outside your area of expertise. But it goes back to my concern, is this something that you need to consider as a parent diagnosis, or as a secondary diagnosis. That information is not clearly outlined. Hence my proposal that we consider doing an ICD webinar either in December or early January when the dust has settled, we have a clear indication of the situation. Now let me move on to the issue of medical necessity. Medical necessity is all the, that you see here. It's scientific, clinical, so forth, so on. However, let me point out the clearly different color bold portion of your middle of the screen medical necessity is nothing more than a cpt by dx formulary what does that mean that we have 8000 cpt codes and approximately 60000 icd codes insurance companies are going to basically have a formulary that says psychotherapy goes with for example, depression, but maybe not with dementia. So if you code psychotherapy and dementia, it could be that information is considered unacceptable and you would have your insurance request denied. So your job, and I encourage you to do this on your own and hopefully with the uh, Excel sheet that we're going to post on psychologycoding.com at the beginning of next month, we might be in a position to figure out what insurance carriers, what particular programs with that insurance allow in terms of CPT by DX. You have to come up with your own formulary. Now, having said that, medically reasonable is basically what do we do to improve the functioning of a body part? That's really what it's all about. Or if you want to put it in more practical terms, it's the existence of evidence 
for therapeutic decision making. Did what you do make a difference in the patient's condition, life, or symptoms? Bottom line is, did you make a difference? Now, keep in mind, just because you think you made a difference does not necessarily make it acceptable because you may have made a difference, but it may not be part of the CPT versus DX formulary. This is what it's all about right there. All right. Now, let's shift our focus to the last part of our short hour here. We're talking about the bottom line. How do we get paid? Here's the history. We started with Cost Plus. We went to PPS. For many of us, it started in psychology in the 80s. We may have seen the DRGs, uh, the CPR, customary, prevailing, and reasonable. It turns out that that went out uh, early in the 80s as well. And we now have the resource-based relative value system, which essentially this is the bottom line. So what's a CPT RVU? CPT RVU is basically the components, units, and values. Let's take a look at that. Okay, this system was started in 1992. There are 4,000 codes that have been recently valued, although 4,000 before then as well. It's a payment system based on costs associated with delivery of that service. This is the interpretation of the value or importance of a CPT code. So if you think about it, let's take uh, the concept of a quarter. On one side, heads, it's CPT, the service, and the other side is tails, which is essentially the cost of that service. Together, we put that in one fell swoop, and we call that CPT. The uh, relative value system started in 1992 with three specialty societies, and basically we have a five-year review that occurs, every, every, the title implies every five years, and now we have a, a new system called a relative assessment work group, which is really complicated, I won't get into, but it does affect us. The uh, relative value system, unlike the CPT, which is made up of 17, this is 31 members, and it's appointed by a national specialist societies. I believe that there's been no uh, non-physician on, on this particular group, although there is representation on the panel through the so-called Healthcare Practice Advisory Committee. Now, how does it work? The CPT, which I've been involved with in 1988, and now I'm actually on the panel itself, request that a new code, for example, we have a new code that's been uh, emerging involving dementia screening. If it passes, then with that code, what happens? Well, it's sent to the relative value committee, and then they distribute it to specialties, for example, psychology, uh, neurology, and so forth, so on. They discuss the value, they decide on the value, and then uh, CMS, uh, gives us thumb up or down. There's one aspect that's important, and that is that specialties actually come up with the value, and that value is then presented to the relative value uh, group. It's based on a survey that includes a very complex methodology, and it's based on a typical patient, not an unusual patient, like a bipolar, uncontrolled, a frontal lobe patient. You know, those, those do exist, but obviously it's not a typical patient. A typical patient would be a demented patient or a depressed patient with maybe one or two comorbid symptoms. Then that typical vignette, usually about a paragraph long, is sent to a random sample. You can see the sample could be as few as 30, 30 individuals like you on this phone call. And then you take a look at that particular vignette and decide how hard is it compared to other activities. Is it easier than, for example, psychotherapy or uh, interviewing? And then you rate it accordingly. That is based on a reference list. So we give you 10 or 20 comparisons 
And then you just estimate how hard is it compared to that. We also often use psychiatric interview <clears throat> as a means to compare. Is this code, let's assume we have something like dementia screening. Would then, is that harder than an interview or less hard? How much time before, during, and after? We rate the intensity and complexity, ranging from time and mental effort to technical skill, physical effort, and psychological stress. This is what we ask people to do. Now, keep in mind, let me go back to this. It could be that 30 of you that fill out the questionnaire, or that is the survey instrument, decide 30, looking at this, end up deciding how many dollars and cents we're going to get paid for the next 10 years. So if you ever get a survey because you're a member of the American Psychological Association, keep in mind that you could be one of 30 that determines how much money we make as a field. So keep in mind that this is what is now the bottom line for Medicare, for Medicaid, and increasingly for prior payers, especially Blue Cross Blue Shield. What's interesting is that the RVU system is not just being used as a method for reimbursement. It is now being used as a method for establishing healthcare practice. And here's what's particularly fascinating. We're now starting to use RVUs as a method to compensate clinicians. If you are a for-profit institution, like Wake Med in Raleigh, North Carolina, that has some awesome neuropsychologists, those people are going to, sooner than later, if they're not at this particular juncture, going to be paid not by how many CPD codes that they actually build, but the RVUs that they have built. This is a new system. In terms of alternative payment models, you are not going to be paid on how much you actually bill, but how many RVUs you build. So what's an RVU? It has a physician work value, a practice expense, a malpractice, and a geographic. We now have to multiply all of these four things. You get a, a number, like for example, two or 3.0. And then that number is multiplied by the conversion factor, which is set by the US Congress every year. As of this year, the conversion factor is 35.9335. So just to make it really simple, 30 of you decide based on the instrument how much we get paid. And then that number is multiplied by a conversion factor which is set by Congress. So the bottom line is we have two variables, what you think as a practitioner and what Congress thinks. Now, don't take this personal. This conversion factor applies to every healthcare professional. I don't care if you're a chiropractor, a surgeon, a psychiatrist, an internal medicine, everybody has to live with this conversion factor. And even though this is set by Congress, this is also used by, as we talked about, Blue Cross Blue Shield and most everybody else. Now, the conversion factor may go up or down. It's been moving around all over the table. So I expect in 2016 for that conversion factor to be uh, a different. Now, I have to be honest with you. This is something that people don't talk about. We got rid of SGR, which is going to theoretically put some stability on this, but it, has, it will cost us approximately $300 billion to get rid of SGR and have a more stable conversion factor. Now, how are we going to work on getting $300 billion? Well, as my son who worked on the original ACA, the devil is in the details. So the RVU is primarily, as you can see, about 51% physician work, practice, that is the cost of the sponges, the Kleenexes, and so forth and so on, is, uh, is the practice expense and liability. Clinical work on part of the physician, which is basically people like you and I, it's mental effort, technical skill, 
physical effort, psychological stress, and time. I just found out about two weeks ago that I, this is a real surprise to me that this concept of mental work actually comes out of NASA laboratories, the TLX program. And they were trying to figure out how much a person should get paid to, uh, that, that, according to them, that depended on how much effort and thought they put into it. So this is a system that is essentially borrowed from uh, aerospace engineering and particularly the NASA program. And of course, there's the practice expense. And the practice expense includes all the things that cost to do business. In the case of most of us, it would be two, two chairs, a table, some Kleenexes, some forms, and of course, everything else associated with expenditures of a building such as overhead, rent, etc. Interestingly, the practice expense includes RNs, but not social workers and testing technicians. They are really different, and as a consequence, we're not, if you will, enveloped in the practice expense in most cases. So we do not have practice expense in psychology or related fields involving personnel. There's all kinds of other practice expense, but not necessarily personnel. So direct costs include supplies, equipment, and of course, rent, utilities, administrative staff time. Now, here's a unusual, significantly detailed breakdown of what an RVU looks like. And you see how careful it comes down to. Very, 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 very scientific, empirically derived. A quick word for those of us that do a lot of testing. It turns out that CMS has looked at the RVUs of testing. And it appears that we have submitted a lot of claims. And as a consequence, we're going through a five-year review as we are with the H and B codes. So we are now basically finding ourselves, for example, that the technical code goes with the professional code. We have large growths that we build over $10 million a year. So this means that those codes are going to have to be revalued. So how do you do a fee schedule? Think about this. That a fee schedule basically is Medicare times 150%. This is typical for most non-mental health specialties, that is physicians, so find out what a typical reimbursement is for your region for a CPT code. Multiply that by 150. And that is the standard fee schedule. That is by history, folklore, and in many ways by design, what people are charging for out-of-network fees. However, having said that, the pricing of codes obviously is based on the carrier that you're working with, CMS, and of course, as I shared with you already, the American Medical Association are a relative value system. Now, the billing is based on the procedure that you did, for example, psychotherapy, the number of units, in most cases it's one, where the location, although that's not necessary, and the date of service. So a model system may be CPT, by unit, by diagnosis, by site of service, and the date. In many ways, this is what's happening. Economics shape payment policy. Payment policy shapes practice. Payment shapes documentation. Docu documentation shapes cognitive processes. And in terms, that shapes practice patterns. So we are finding ourselves in a very different world. We have an alternative payment models, and those models include quality metrics, outcome, bundle payment, and population-based systems. This is the beginning of a new tsunami. So for starters, one of the things that's important is to realize that we will be involved with other healthcare providers. The days of being isolation or silos, just mental health, are slowly but surely coming to an end. 
Surprisingly, 50% of all mental health care is done by primary care providers. And it looks like, whether we like it or not, we're going to be forced into integrating, especially with chronic illnesses. So this is due largely, if not maybe exclusively, to the health care bill, which is theoretically a moral bill, ensuring 34 million individuals, but theoretically it's about dollars and cents. One of the things that's going to change is the development of an accountable care organization. You have one in your community, and hopefully sooner or later, you'll be part of that. This is theoretically to increase efficiency in healthcare. In my estimate, this is going to be due to a system where you expand Medicaid eligibility, depending on the state that you live in. It's going to be competency based. As of uh, the first quarter of 2015, where we have the latest information, a little less than 12% of the US population has signed up or approximately 11.4 million. I'm not sure why we had a small dip. Some people have actually exited the ACOs. However, the goal is essentially to save Medicare up to $1 billion a year. You will also be seeing insurance exchanges. And I predict that this is basically Medicare light or an expanded Medicare program. The difference between ACO an insurance exchange may be minor, but we will emphasize prevention and integrative care. Now, how in the heck are we going to go ahead and participate on this? Just a few uh, days ago at the uh, American Medical Association RUC meeting, uh, a presentation was uh, put forth by Harold Miller, one of the consultants working with RUC in, in terms of developing a new uh, system for payment. So, Let's go through this. These slides, by the way, are basically summaries of his uh, comments. This is going to be initiated by 2018, and it will begin to be applied in 2019, and it will be the standard by 2025. The rule of thumb, the greater that the risk that you take, the greater the reward, and for that matter, loss. So if you're working with counseling uh, cases in a community, um, uh, college uh, situation, you're probably not going to have a great risk, but also not a great reward. If you're working with a homeless individuals with bipolar disorders and dementia, the reward will be great, but so will the potential loss. So we now have a fee-for-service system. By 2017, we will move to a fee for documentation totally. It's called MIPS, M-I-P-S. The beginning of that is what you and I know as PQRS. By 2019, this will shift for a fee for performance. It's called the MACRA system. The focus will be on getting patients out of the hospital or keeping them out of the hospital and on qualified health providers and prescription drugs. The goal, as you see at the bottom of this presentation, of this slide, I should say, redistributing above cost by changing the delivery model. Changing the delivery model. What does that mean? Well, well, we're gonna go ahead and try and reduce total spending by state, by group, or by condition. We believe that some costs are unavoidable. If you're demented or schizophrenic, there's not much we can do. Maybe some shifting, of course, but there are some disorders that are extremely changeable. Diabetes is a wonderful example. Maybe anxiety is another. Those are changeable and fixable. The focus will not be on chronic conditions like schizophrenia and dementia that have a lower probability of changing it will be on those that can be changed. So how do we do that? Unavoidable tests, unnecessary tests, the use of lower cost procedures. Can we do outpatient psychotherapy versus inpatient? Can we do intense therapy or manage the case? Can we be more efficient in how we deliver what we do? 
Can we have lower costs? And this is sort of makes me nervous. Does that mean that someone with a master's degree that charges less will be used instead of someone with a doctorate degree? Don't be surprised. The lower cost providers will have greater access in the system. Uh, Home-based post-acute care will be much more valued than hospitalizations. And if we can't prevent a complication, we will go do so. So there'll be greater focus more than ever on prevention, for example, on smoking and obesity will be two big issues. I think individuals involved in health psychology will gain a great amount in this particular new system. What's the alternative? Well, medical homes, hospital-based episodes, and affordable care organizations. This is essentially what is evolving as we speak. Many of you are part of ACOs. Some of you are part of medical homes. Now, here's another one. We're going to focus on specific services. We're going to focus on specific disorders. And look at this bundle payment to a hospital. And here's a bizarre one. A warranty payment. So, for example, the insurance company might pay you $2,000 to treat a depressed person. And it could be that if you end up spending $4,000, you lose two. But if you're efficient and can solve the problem in less than $2,000, you make a great deal of money. This is a new world, folks. So we're going to shift from worrying about ACA only to having what I call Medicaid light. We're going to shift to the lowest common denominator from Medicare to Medicaid. And in essence, this is how it's going to be. Today, you and I are living primarily in fee-for-service world. We're moving very quickly in fee-for-documentation, or what you and I call, for example, PQRS. PQRS has historically been only something for Medicare, but it's now going to become also for Blue Cross Blue Shield and others. And by 2017, possibly 18, we will shift to fee for performance. And in essence, we will be dealing with all these issues. I, I am sure that by 2018, we all will be part of a medical home, hospital-based episodes, or ACOs. But in addition to that, there will be other activities <coughs> that will be emerging. So what's the bottom line? Who gets paid is a quick and important question. In other words, it could be that you get paid. For example, I build an insurance company and I get paid a certain amount of money. However, increasingly, payments will be bundled. In other words, a particular patient will be for example, will have depression and diabetes, that patient will be sent to a group, a hospital, an ACA, with a chunk of change, 1,000, 5,000. And they'll be told, fix the diabetes, fix the depression. And if they work together in unison, in interactive fashion, integrated care, and they do so in less money than has been given, they will obviously have un unbelievable benefits, a tremendous income revenue uh, potential. But also, if you take $10,000 to fix that problem, you will lose a great deal of amount. So how is this going to be done? It's going to be based on the relative value system that you and I talked about. That will be the bottom line, the, the sort of the, the lowest common denominator. And it'll be performance-based. So they'll basically take give a certain amount of money to a group, be bundled, and then you'll get your bid based on your performance using the relative value system. This will be by the end of this decade, and it's gonna be a different approach. Now, having said that, I end my presentation on this slide that I've used before. This is my daughter, who's also a psychologist, and our first grandchild. And it comes from uh, the saying, I feel fine, comes from REM. And uh, 
it's the end of the world as we know it. And I, I feel fine. Two or three of my children are psychologists. Obviously, I think that there's a future. Otherwise, I wouldn't have encouraged them. And the other one happens to be a political economist. So we blend all those three, and I feel fine. So with this, uh, let me just add one more quick comment uh, before I stop sharing the screen. And also say that we have lots of resources and they're found in different locations and we will post this. I encourage you to take a look at the sample forms in the psychotherapy, excuse me, psychology coding website. You can buy information or the uh, CBT code book from AMA. And of course, you can always contact me as well. So thank you for joining us in CPT webinar number five. I will stop sharing the screen. I will go back to here and, and we are now going to ask questions. Please click on the grid to the top right hand corner of your screen uh, to enable the blue Q&A and we will take some questions. And uh, let's see whether we have some questions. If not, I'll ask a couple before we call it a day. So at this point, I have no questions. So what would I do if I was in your shoes? Let's just kind of go with the basics. First of all, you need to try and learn specifically the ICD system. And then in addition to that, you need to get ready for a big change in what's coming down. This is a new approach to diagnosing that we're in the middle of. And at this particular juncture, I don't know exactly which one is going to work and which one is not going to work. And then after that, we need to begin to get ready for shifting from fee for service to fee for documentation. And once we have that down, fee for performance. Thank you. By all means, drop me a line if you have a specific questions. Puente at uncw.edu. Look forward to seeing you at the uh, next broadcast. And if not, look forward to putting together an ICD um, uh, 10 presentation because things are changing. Until November 16th in the revised testing code. Uh, thank you for joining us from Wilmington, North Carolina. Have a good day. See ya.